Yadira, Amy Olivera, and my mentor's name is Dr. Thomas Power, and he's the chair of the Human Development Department. My, the title of my project is Latinas Mothers Interaction Quality and Children's Emotional Regulation. So you guys have probably gone to a grocery store and you've seen a child probably on the floor screaming, yelling, making sure everybody hears that his mom is not going to let, them get, let the, him get that candy bar. You can be one of two people. You can be that one person that is staring at the interaction in awe with your mouth open and just saying, oh my gosh, that poor woman. Or you could be that other lady that walks, or man, that walks away from the situation thinking, thank goodness that I know other children who are more emotionally regulated. <laughs> so what is emotional regulation? It has been defined in various ways, but overall it refers to an individual motivation and capability to control their emotions and behaviors in order to achieve goals. And it's important because when one regulates their own emotions, they're able to interact with their peers, with their parents, and also with teachers. And so through emotional regulation, children are able to achieve more in school, they're able to resist temptation, and also become more socially capable. Also, they're able to gain more problem-solving skills and able to accomplish tasks. There has been a lot of uh, research done on factors that influence emotional regulation. Some of these factors are child's temperament, the child's age, the child's gender, and their social context as well. So one area that has been studied quite a deal is parents' contributions to their children's emotional regulation. However, this has been done mostly on American European samples that are in the middle class whereas other diverse populations have not been studied. So therefore, with this, with this study, I hope to look at parenting practices in relation to emotional regulation in mother and child interaction in play. And since socioeconomic status and culture do play a very large role in parenting practices, it's also very important to understand that looking at different diverse populations and see how they uh, how they play a role in their own children's emotional regulation. So, as I said, emotional regulation is really important in various aspects of, oh, the music's on, various <laughs> aspects of um, ch children's emotional regulation. So, it has been correlated with social competence, and a number of studies have found uh, that they looked at children's social competence, and they found that children who are more emotionally regulated uh, tend to show that less anger towards others and they tend to have more social skills as well. Whereas it's been associated also with academic competence, where it's been found where preschool years have been predictive of how well a child would do academically in their kindergarten years and so on. In addition to that, children have been described as socially competent um, and they also tend to achieve higher in school. They also are able to have a more positive view of school and they're able to adapt more smoothly into school as well. And lastly, the ability to delay impulses is a really big deal of emotional regulation. It's important to understand um, how simply being able to control one's emotions can lead to their children's, uh, the child's to be more emotionally acceptable. So if a child can control their impulses, this tends to mean that they're able to uh, self-soothe themselves, they're able to have more attentional control, and they're also able to express the appropriate emotions during the situation. has measured in mainly two ways. The first is the, oh, the first is the structured challenging tasks. And the goal of these tasks are to frustrate the child. So for example, tasks like delay gratification tasks, uh, re, uh, waiting for rewards tasks, or slowing down finer gross motor tasks are examples of what would be used. <coughs> The second way is a rating of the child by either parents or teachers, and this would be through um, giving the parent or teachers or anyone that comes in contact with the child on a regular basis. Um, they give the, the parents or teachers a form or a questionnaire where they are asked to answer questions or rate the child through their behavior to rate the emotional regulation. 
So I examined five different aspects of the parental relationship, positive affect, negative affect, sensitivity, intrusiveness, and detached manner. And now I'm going to talk about these and define them and talk about the literature within all of them. And also, due to the lack of empirical studies on the diverse populations, most of this literature review is based on middle class European, American European populations. European American populations. Well, the first is positive, uh, maternal positive affect. And this refers to um, when a mother gives warmth towards her child, and she, through her, it's through her tone of voice, through her physical expressions and her mannerisms. And this would be actions like smiling, praising, uh, laughing, or being enthusiastic, or even looking, having eye contact with the child when communicating with him or her. So through the parent-child interaction, children are able to develop emotional regulation strategies. So through these strategies, children learn to deal with emotional situations first in the family context, and then they're able to generalize that into other situations, whether it's at school or with just peers. And along with that, these interactions also help parents demonstrate appropriate ex uh, emotions of when they should be expressed during certain situations. So children are learning what emotions are acceptable, when and where. According to Thompson, when parents model positive affect, ch children are more likely to exhibit the same emotions. Thus, they're leading to positive, learning positive emotional regulation. So as for negative affect, so it's similar to positive affect, only in a negative perspective. It refers to the mother's negative negativity towards her child through her tone of voice, her physical expressions, and her mannerisms. And this would include actions like expressing disapproval, uh, tense body, and negative tone of voice when correcting, or even threatening or yelling to, at the child. And negative parental emotion, particularly anger, is related to lower levels of emotional regulation. And similar to positive affect, so parents who display more negative affect tend to encourage their children to do the same. Therefore, children who are more negative tend to have a less likely chance to have positive interactions with not just their parents, but also with their teachers and their peers. Um, and also there's a greater chance for these children to experience a lower social functioning because they tend to have very low levels of emotional regulation. As for maternal sensitivity, this refers to parents' ability to appropriately and consistently meet child's needs. This would include soothing or calming the child when the child's upset or distressed. This would also include, include responding appropriately to the child's mannerisms, their gestures, their words or expressions, and taking interest in the child's activities, along with being able to adapt to the child's developmental level and their mood as well. And so as many, as it's, sensitivity has been associated with parental uh, or attachment and emotional regulation. And this is because it plays such a huge role in the way children process and understand their own emotions. So parents' acknowledgement of the child's emotional expressions has been correlated with emotional regulation. So, for example, Eisenberg and colleagues have found that parents who help their children manage their emotion through discussion um, tend to have children who are more emotionally regulated as well. And also parents who engage in maternal soothing during a, dif a, difficult, well, a difficult situation tend to have children who use distraction during a difficult task um, and distraction during a difficult task has been associated with higher levels of emotional regulation. And these children also who engage in these distractions are also more likely to use verbal objections rather than physical objections in an angry situation with the peer. And parental intrusiveness, this refers to um, when a parent imposes their own agenda to the child despite signals from the child that the child needs a different level or pace or activity, um, whether if the child expresses negative affect or turns away from the activity that the parent is trying to impose, that's an example of the child being intrusive, of the parent being intrusive. And intrusiveness is argued to contribute to children's emotional dysregulation, 
And, since, and this is because since the parent is always intruding, they're not giving the child an opportunity to develop emotional regulation. And studies have explained that because children have intrusive parents, they feel a lack of control. And this lack of control leads them to become more easily frustrated along with also becoming uh, more overstimulated, leading them to express more negative affect as well. And lastly, detached manner. This refers to when a parent uh, behaves as they're unaware of the child's needs. Even after the child is actively trying to seek attention, the parent is acting unaware. Or if the parent does respond, they um, indicate that there is a lack of attention and a lack of true engagement in general. And detached manner has not been examined as frequently as the parental aspects, as I spoke ab about. And so I was unable to find any literature uh, about detached manner and children's emotional regulation. But I found that it was really important to continue to code for this because of the lack of research out there. So as I said, most research on this topic has been done on European American mothers in the middle class. And so I was unable to find any literature on the ethnic minority children's emotional regulation in relation to the mother interactions of play. And, but I did find an article by Espa and colleagues that did not look at emotional regulation, but it did look at the same dimensions that I'm looking at. And it did relate to mother-child play, but and it also looked at uh, European American mothers, African American mothers, and Latino mothers. And they found that the negative association between maternal intrusiveness and child engagement was only significant in American European mothers. So there has been discussion on expanding or revising the standard parent, uh, parenting measurement style measurements because these parenting styles have been constructed to fit middle class European American values, their norms, and their parental experiences. So because of this, research on Latino parenting has varied quite a deal where some Latino parenting parents have been described as permissive while others have been described as authoritarian. And so by expanding and revising these um, parental styles uh, and dimensions, in order uh, to fit the cultures. It's the best way to investigate if these are applicable to other diverse populations. So, uh, to summarize, the five dimensions that I was looking at is positive affect, negative affect, sensitivity, intrusiveness, and detached manner. And I examined them and, they, I, saw, and I tried to find uh, how they were related to emotional regulation in preschool age children in the Head Start program um, compared to the interactions with their mothers uh, in the Houston area. So there's two hypotheses in the study. The first was mother's positive affect and sensitivity would positively correlate with emotional regulation. And then the second was mother's negative affect, sensitivity, and detached manner will be negatively correlated with children's emotional regulation. But given the findings of the ESPA and colleagues article, it is possible that, that intrusiveness will be weaker than the negative affect and detached manner relationship. Um, so the, as it, sorry, this was a correlational study. And the Latino families were recruited from the uh, Houston area in the Head Start Center. And 45 Latino, L Latino mothers and children's videos were observed by two observers. And the mothers were part of a larger study that was looking at children's emotional regulation and their eating behavior. And this study was funded by a grant through the Child's Nutrition Center in Houston, which is the, my mentor's own study, and that is the reason why I'm specifically looking at this sample in the Houston area. I did not go to Houston. And um, so the children's mean age is about 57 months, and that's about four years, while the mom's mean age is about 29 years. And again, all of these moms were low income because one of the requirements for a Head Start is that children have to come from low income households. So uh, the mothers were coming to the laboratory room, which was a room with cameras, and it was located in the Child's Nutrition Center. And children would enter the room and they would play with their mothers for about eight minutes. And the mother had, oh, excuse me, the room had three piles of toys. The first pile had a baby doll with a bottle and a change of clothes. The next pile had um, a cups, plastic cups, plastic silverware, and plates with a set of plastic food. And the other pile had matchbox cars and metal box. So as soon as the child and the mother would enter the room, the coordinator would say, this is where we're going to be spending most of our time here today. 
why don't you let your child get used to the room and you ch your child can play with the toys and I'll be back in about 10 minutes. And then the coordinator would leave the room, leaving the child and mother to engage. In addition to that, mothers were also asked to complete a series of questionnaires uh, to, while the child was involved in other tasks for the larger study, and two of those questionnaires were used for this present study. So the first one was a demographic form, and this provided all the demographic information of the participants in the study. And the second was the emotional regulation checklist, and this was a 24-item questionnaire that measured two aspects of child's, children's behavior. The first was lability, and the second one was emotional regulation. And the mother scored it on a four, uh, on a four point scale, four point scale. And the, for example, lability is a term that means emotional instability. For items that would be under the scale would be, my child is prone to angry outbursts, or my child is prone to mood swings. Whereas uh, emotional regulation and items that would be under that scale would be, my child responds appropriately to negative and positive situations, or my child is cheerful. So for videotape coding, um, the study used the, code, the home observation coding system, and the system was used to measure the global emotional environment, and it was adapted for the free play task because originally this uh, um, coding system was used for in-home uh, observation along with the more specifically the dining task, so just watching the family eat food. And the system consisted of the five parental variables and the global ratings were what on a five point scale rate basis, so one was never present to five was predominantly present. And each eight minute video was divided into four two minute segments and observed twice. So, what, 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 when coding one video, the observer would first watch the, the video the first time and would stop, they would stop it for every two minutes and code for positive affect and negative affect. Then after they watched the whole eight minutes, they would rewatch the video, stop it every two minutes again, and then code for intrusiveness, sensitivity, and detached manner. And this was just done to make sure that the coder was looking at what they were supposed to be looking at. It's very easy to intermix, you know, there's five things that they're looking at, they need to make sure that they're looking at what they're supposed to be looking at. And as for reliability, two coders coded a coder, <laughs> a quarter of the videos, and reliability was achieved in all the global ratings except for detached manner. And that was because detached manner, there was not any variance within the mothers, meaning that none of the mothers were coded as detached. So, so since the questionnaire was developed for middle-class European American mothers, it was important to assess the reliability and the validity in the Latino population that are low income. So the Chromebox Alpha was calculated for both lability and emotional regulation. And as you can see, the Chromebox Alpha was negative 0.05 and the emotional regulation Chromebox Alpha was 0.62. And ideally, uh, you would want a 0.7 or above. But because of the fact that emotional regulation had very, uh, very small number of items, we found, I found that it was acceptable to keep. But as a strategy um, to develop a subskill to assess reliability, a principal component analysis was conducted involving the all 15 lability items. So to identify the factors, a very nice rotation was conducted. <coughs> In addition to that, the screen plot and the follow-up coefficient identified two factors. And as you can see, uh, the first one was anger, which had uh, the alpha of 0.62. And the second one was negativity towards others, which had 0.63. So again, these do look low, but due to the fact that there was a very small number of items that were associated with them, they were acceptable. So <laughs> it's clear that this was not the best questionnaire to use for this population. But given that the, the numbers that were obtained from the, these prelim, pre, preliminary analysis, it's um, acceptable to continue with the analysis, the rest of the analysis. So the correlations with the demographic var variables, uh, the study found that mothers were found to express more negative affect towards their boys, where boys were found to express more anger than girls, and lastly, mother's educational level was positively correlated with children's expressing less negativity towards others. 
Um, so the Pearson correlations were run between maternal global ratings and the child's behavior ratings to test the hypotheses that mother's uh, maternal behavior would predict child's emotional regulation. And here you can see here in sensitivity that mother's sensitivity was the only uh, was the only predictor of children's em emotional or children's behavior here, right? And then you can see here that mothers who were more sensitive had children who expressed uh, less anger. And there was a trend right here where mothers who were more sensitive also had children who expressed less negativity towards others. So there were many strengths in this study. Uh, one of the strengths was the use of a low-income minority group population and then the, the use of a well-developed coding system along with the two-month coding training, and then the combination of observer coding and self-reports, and of course the measurement of multiple variables. So despite these uh, strengths, there were some limitations, which were the first was the, it was a correlational study, meaning that it's not possible to establish causality. Second was the self-report questionnaires. This, the use of a self-report method gives participants an opportunity to skew their answers to make themselves look better sometimes, or in this case, make their children seem better, more emotionally regulated. And the questionnaire was also not developed for this population, so therefore, as I already said, it did lead to some correlational measurement issues. And then lastly, the sample was small and difficult to generalize to the general population because we, uh, the study specifically recruited these mothers from the Head Start Center in Houston. So for future research, um, in order to establish causality, it would be important to conduct a parenting training study where the manipulation variable would be the mothers who gain the training or, or gain the, the parent trainings and maybe learn some skills or strategies to deal with their children, whether it's just simply talking to them or disciplining them, and comparing as the control variable with mothers who do not get this training, and then comparing those two groups' children's emotional regulation through time and see how they differ. Another uh, important thing to do is having both mother and teacher rate the child on emotional regulation. Therefore, this can possibly eliminate the bias that the mother may have by having both the mother and the teacher evaluate the child's emotional regulation in addition to having the child perform challenging tasks. So by doing these three, these three things, by having the mother both and the teacher rate the emotional regulation and having the child perform challenging tasks would be better um, to assess the child's emotional regulation. And lastly, using a larger sample that can include other sample populations would also be important to do because it would be good to see how other populations differ. As for implications, through the findings that maternal sensitivity um, predict child's emotional regulation, this can infer that mothers may have a very important role um, in their ch children's emotional regulation development. So simply being aware of this may help a mother understand that she needs to be more careful with responding to her child and think more about being sensitive. In addition to that, the gender differences, uh, mothers' interactions with their sons were more negative than with the girls, and boys did express more anger than girls did as well. So this can suggest that mother parents might need to modify their parenting styles to, to adjust their child's gender. So by doing this, how can this be done? Developing programs for low-income mothers or low-educated mothers, this can benefit these women from these backgrounds because it can give them some strategies or some ways to cope with trying to deal with their children, um, specifically boys sometimes because they have been found to be more aggressive than girls. So by having moms be more aware, I said, um, can have the mom be, okay, this is a strategy that I can know. I can, I, that I can use with my child. So, you know, have, some mothers don't even know the counting technique where they could be like, Tommy, I'm going to count to five. If you don't stop acting like that, mom's not going to be very happy. So then right there, the child understands, okay, this is a warning. My mom is about to be mad. So because I don't want my mom to be mad, I need to stop what I'm doing. Therefore, that can eliminate the negative interaction between the mother and the child and have a more positive and strong relationship between the mother and the child. So pretty much I feel any program that hopes to improve a parent's interaction with their children is worth consideration. So I would like to thank my mentor, Dr. Thomas Power. He really helped me out. He was really patient with me, specifically with the statistics, because I had no idea what I was doing. But he really helped. Like, he did everything he could to make me understand. And it worked. 
And I would also like to thank the McNair program. We would this couldn't have been done with, um, without it. And also my peers and because you guys all attended. So thank you so much. Do you guys have any questions? Do you think also, especially on the cultural side, of the, the father could be a playing role, especially on, if it's on boys being more, having more anger issues than uh, girls, wouldn't that be a factor, especially seeing more, sometimes the father's the, uh, has more the last say or the rule in Latino uh, populations, wouldn't that be an important aspect to look as well? That is important if you're looking at first generation parenting. A lot of these moms were first generation, but there were also moms that were second generation. And some of the studies that came across that were not related to my literature, but I did read them because of interest, but it was found that mothers, like second generation families with mothers and fathers, they tend to have a more equal say in their children's. So sometimes it is that way where the father has the last say, but definitely that is something that can be considered, especially with the culture aspect of it. Who were the coders? Um, one of the coders was my friend Terry Oliveira, no relation, and myself. And what we would do is we went through the training and we started around uh, early April. And we would, we would pretty much practice a couple times and then after uh, that was two months of practicing, we ended up doing reliability in a separate session, and we ended up achieving it. Is this research that you plan to pursue in um, graduate school? I don't think so. I enjoyed it very much, and I definitely, um, you know, I definitely enjoyed that I got this experience, but I feel like I'm, I've learned that I have I really enjoy looking at parent relationships, but I'm more interested in the adolescent relationship with the parent rather than the preschool age. But definitely, I enjoyed what I did, and maybe in the future, if I like, I'm like, hey, I really like that, maybe I should go back to that. I think maybe, yeah. At uh, what age do you think people should start like implementing this? As soon, I feel like um, specifically toddler age would be, because that's when toddlers are starting to communicate. And it's been found that when parents talk to their children more than punish them physically, um, simply by talking to the children, they start to use induction, which is uh, children are starting to internalize rules, where when they internalize these rules, they say in the future, they don't need their parent to be like, oh, I can't do that. They can do it themselves. So as soon as the child learns this, the more likely they are to use it throughout their lives. And so toddlerhood is the best time because that's when they are starting to learn how to speak. 